she's England's finest as well, Miss Hannah Rankin. Welcome to Hannah Rankin. How you doing, cool, baby? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah, uh, just before we uh, record this, uh, we were just talking how we go back, I think it has to be 2017. Yeah, it goes like way back. Just yeah. way back. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's amazing. I'm addressing you as a champ and behind you, I'm seeing a prestigious WBA belt and IBO, which you won on Saturday against Maria Lind Lindbergh. But before we get to that, can you just briefly tell some of our, our viewers and listeners who don't know much about your story, how did your love affair of boxing actually begin? So um, I actually moved down to London about 10 years ago to do my master's at the World Academy of Music. I'm a classical musician. So I moved down here for that. It was always a dream of mine to live in London. And I was just wanting to get fit at the gym. So I, was jo I joined the boxing classes um, and I uh, was just doing it for fun. And then did some white collar boxing and did some, some of the fights for that to raise money for charity and, and have a go. I just want to see what it's like to compete. And then I thought, you know, what, I want to take it to the next step. So I turned pro and... Uh, yeah, became Scotland's first first female world champion, and uh, on Friday night came a two times world champion with the WBA and the IBO uh, on Fight Zone. Um, one of the best nights of my life. <laughs> I mean, it's it's, it's brilliant to, to hear that now you speak about how being um, two time world champion or two belt world champion. Um, when you came to London from Scotland, you had no idea that you would have a love affair box, so it came almost out the blue. Absolutely out of the blue. I, when I was a kid, I used to do Taekwondo. So, um, you know, I've always enjoyed combat sports. I've enjoyed watching it. I, you know, it's something that appeals to me. I, lo I love the discipline of it. And I think that's probably come from actually my musical background, because, you know, in music, you have to practice, you dedicate your time, you've got to be disciplined. And the same thing applies in boxing. Um, the best thing about boxing as well is you, you can't learn everything. So it kind of drew me to it as something that's like, is always new things to learn and try out different things, styles, techniques, combinations. So um, yeah, no, I, I never thought about ever doing any, any boxing until I moved to London. So yeah, a bit of a change around for my career, but uh, it's cool, you know? <laughs> and when you came to London, one of the first persons you met was Derek Sweet P. Williams, who yeah. is former Commonwealth champion, heavyweight champion of the world who was well known for his fight against Lennox Lewis. What was that like meeting Derek for the first time? Derek's a legend. He's probably one of the nicest guys. And also like, when I first met him, he was sitting down beside the ring at gym box because he was he just finished a class. And um, I, I met him there because I was coming in for something else, uh, did another class after it. And I didn't realize quite how big he was because he was just sitting down relaxed. And then suddenly he stood up and suddenly there was this like heavyweight giant in front of me. And I was just like, wow, this guy is huge. Um, but I used to, I love training with Derek and, and he introduced me to Noel and uh, we all got on really, really well. Derek was my first ever manager in boxing. Um, he just kind of helped instill a love in the sport for me and uh, like just like fired up my interest in it. And I used to love training with him, he was great. Because uh, you mentioned Noel, who um, I have um, know very well, and obviously the three of us, we have a really close relationship. But Noel is someone I've known from um, the, the, the fitness world. And Noel um, was the vehicle, well, was, well obviously um, you met Noel through um, um, Derek Sweepy Williams, but you, you basically met Noel and Noel became your coach. How did that come about? Because Noel was your coach for white collar boxing. Yeah. And then so that transformation from white collar box, how did that, how did that all transpire? So basically, uh, he used to take the boxing classes at gym box, and I used to go to the boxing classes, and he said, you know, you're good at this, you should come to the sparring classes. So I came down to the sparring classes, and then I thought, you know what, I'll give a white collar fight a try. Um, he was my training for that, and then I wanted to go to the next step, and he tried to fob me off and send me off to an amateur club <laughs> and say, you know, it'd be good for you to go to an amateur club, get some experience, do that, do some amateur bouts. But I was like, no, I like my team, you know. I'm, it's something from my musical background. It's like, if you find a teacher and people that work well for you and you gel well with them, it's like, you, you don't have any reason to, to go looking at elsewhere, doing other stuff. So team has always been important to me. And uh, so I was like, no, I want to stay with you. And I want to stay with Derek. Like, what, what can we do next? And he's like, well, the only next step is for you to go professional. And um, I was like, oh, why not? <laughs> so he said, let's go and get some spying with some, some of the pros and see, see how you do, you know? Um, and he was very wary, very careful with it all. I just like checking it all out. But when I got out of my first professional sparring session, um, 
like it was a tough spot it was really hard but like in the car on the way home i was just like when are we going back i want to do this <laughs> i want to do this i want to try this out and i want to see how i can do that and he just knew that i had an absolute love for it and he said that you know we're both we're very similar in the fact that we just if you say we can't do something, we're going to go and do it. And, uh, you know, we're so, so driven and focused and we just gel very well together. I mean, you know, um, at what point did you say, I'm going to go pro? Because you had about, what, three or four white, it wasn't that many white collar boxing fights. I think I did five, uh, six by that point. I've done six. And at the sixth fight, did you say, well, let's try pro? Or did you say at the third, fourth or fifth fight? I mean, when, when did that... It was actually at the end, I was, at, um, you know, I did my sixth fight and I was like, well, what, what's the next step? You know, what can I do? What? That's my nature, you know, if I achieve one thing, I want to achieve the next big thing. You know, I want to do the next thing and push myself and try something different. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at the time when I look back, I was crazy, you know, like it's, <laughs> <laughs> you look at it and you think, what a crazy thing to think. Oh, man, I'm a professional sport that I haven't done that much of. Um, but yeah, Noel always said, he's like, you had a talent for it. It's just that you you know, hadn't had the experience. And that's why he tried to get me to go to an amateur club because, you know, I would have got more experience and things like that. But it has meant all the way through my career, I've been learning on the job. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I've never shied away from a challenge. I don't know. We've always taken everything that's been put forward and fought all over the world, uh, fought in out of my weight classes, uh, all various weight classes these days. Right, but, right. Yeah, it was, um, I think, it's really special because we both started this journey together. He got his pro license to take me pro. I got my pro license and kind of like I said the other night, it's like from nothing to something. And then we've kind of got to everything. Yeah. And uh, it's a really, really special journey. And, and to have achieved that together when, especially when people thought we were nuts, you know, like they were like, yeah. you're never going to do anything anything big and now I'm, I'm sitting here as a two times world champion so yeah. well you know it's funny we're going to talk about that level of experience in a minute because I want to talk about the uh, the fight experience which I think a lot of people need to understand how grueling of a sport boxing is I think people most people around the world do understand that but it's the behind the scenes stuff yeah. that people don't know that really takes its toll on most fighters um, and then to see fighters especially the male fighters who stay and have a very, very long career. Some of them do. Um, and it's almost nuts to hear that a fighter will fight beyond the age of 40. For example, Klitschko for Anthony Joshua when he was 41. Yeah. It sounds bizarre in itself. And it, you know, for all the hoopla about Joshua, it was a great achievement he beat Klitschko, but he actually beat an old man. A guy in boxing terms is old. Oh, yeah. um, and let's fast forward to your situation. You fought Maria Lindbergh, who was actually yeah. 44. And 13 years your senior. Now, obviously, we know that Maria fought um, a girl that you fought and lost to uh, that uh, basically, basically um, forced a TKO when you fought her. Yeah. And, you know, and she's also trained by uh, Peter Fury. And, you know, the girl I'm going to talk about is Savannah Marshall. Yeah. Now, when Maria fought Savannah Marshall, Savannah disposed of her very, very uh, easily. Yeah. When you fought Maria, what was that like? Because she's 44, she's a little older than when she fought Savannah, but you still said it was a tough, tough fight. So and I think it's what like? people, I think people got kind of het up on this whole age thing. Uh, so in women's boxing, we all tend to go a little bit longer because it's only now that we're starting to get the opportunities that mm. were never there for us before. You know, we've now got platforms to, like, platforms to actually fight on. People can watch us. And also... I think with Maria, you do her, people do her a disservice because yes, she's 44, but she lives and breathes boxing. Mm -hmm. You know, like she has her own gym. Uh, she trains amateur fighters. Uh, she, when she took the Savannah fight, it was on like three days notice wow. and she rocked up and she was bang on 154 or something ridiculous. Like, she, yeah. you know, as both of us stepped up to middleweight to fight Savannah. So it's not our natural weight class, but like I knew that Maria was going to turn up. This is one of her last opportunities to get her hands on a world title. She's had lots of uh, uh, chances beforehand. And I, I personally think she's been robbed a couple of times of, of, of the chance to get a world title. So I was completely not underestimating the fact that she was going to turn up with like every, all guns blazing as this is her last sort of big opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to get her hands on one. And I don't think that should be underestimated. I like fighting for a world title. It always brings the best out of people. Right. Um, and 
I, I said this to people in the lead up to it. I was like, no, I'm, I'm very, very aware of the fact that she's going to be absolutely bringing it. Age isn't a factor. And we're both um, experienced actually at a high level in the same way, even though right. she's much more, she has more fights under her belt. Right. Um, we both fought at the higher level, uh, for the elite level much more. Um, and the same as each other. So I, I was going into this fight very well prepared that she was going to bring it. Mm -hmm. So by that stage, uh, I was talking to Noel, um, your, your, your head trainer, um, uh, yesterday, in fact, we was going back and forth with some messages. In fact, he, he you know, it was really funny. Saturday night, because I was un unable to be at the fight. And when he sent me the message, we did it, man. We did it. I'm a little hungover. And I'm like, what's this guy talking about? And he left me a voice message saying, we gave this girl, Maria, every opportunity, everything she wanted to yeah. give her the training camp she wanted, get her coaches over here. Yeah. I mean, I think you guys even paid for the um, the uh, the travel arrangements for her team. Yeah, uh, she got a ten week tra 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 ten week training camp, so there could be no excuse that she didn't have enough time no. to prepare for this fight. So you gave her every opportunity to make it a fair fight from that point of view. Well, I, I personally strongly believe in that. Like, I don't feel that as a fighter, I wouldn't feel very good about my opponent having had three weeks notice or, or less than that to come in and fight me for a world title. Right. Um, I'm really, all of my opponents have had opportunities to train for our fights and have a, a training camp for my a title fights because right. I don't feel you should be like, I don't know, like limiting people the opportunity to prepare. Like, and then when you, when I stepped in the ring on, on Friday night and my arm was raised at the end, I knew I'd beaten someone who'd had the same amount of time to prepare for this, right. and uh, and I was just better. And uh, do you know that? And I think that's a for me that's really important because I, when I finish my career, I want to say that I fought the best. I took all opportunities that were given out. I took every single challenge, and people had a fair amount of time to train and prepare to fight me. Mm -hmm. um, just at that moment about fair and preparation and um, your fighting experience. I want to talk about a little bit before we move forward about the background in terms of your amateur background. You said earlier you were learning on the job. And for people who don't know you, you didn't have any amateur background. Your amateur background more or less was white collar boxing, which isn't yeah. the same. No, so it's absolutely have, not. <laughs> absolutely not. It's barnyard fighting sometimes. Uh, you always look polished. So you always look like you knew what you were doing in comparison to the people that you were fighting up against who did the best they could. And on the international scene, unlike Savannah Marshall, unlike Clarissa Shields, two girls, I'll stop there, two girls who you fought, who have had extensive amateur background. Yeah. What was it like getting the ring with those girls in terms of, because it's obviously a difference in class in terms of when you're fighting someone that's had a lot of amateur experience and pro experience. For you, what was that learning curve like? Oh, well, like, you know, as I say to people, like you always learn the most from your losses. Um, and what is what you do after that that counts like if you you learn something but you don't take it on board or you know how like that, that then it's a wasted opportunity you might as well have not bothered having the fight you right. know and uh, if you go in there and give the best of yourself and you still come up short then the other person was better then you can't feel disappointed in yourself whereas if you go in there and you don't really perform to the best of your ability then that's when things become disappointing and uh you know it's negative but I, going in with people who have that amount of experience like you know, for me, I've got a lot of my experience sparring all over the world. I've sparred nearly every, like all lots of the girls, all different weight classes uh, all around the world. And that's how I really got my experience. You know, I didn't have all that amateur background. Um, and of course, I would love to wind back the clock and when I was like, you know, younger and think, oh, maybe I'll just go join an amateur club. You know, it would be great <laughs> to have had that experience because what it gives you is, um, you know, that, that sort of knowledge of what it's like to compete. You know, for me, like, Technically, if you count it up, so that's me you have 16 pro fights, then you add my six white collar fights, mm -hmm. you know, like <laughs> I've had 22 yeah. fights in the ring, full stop, yeah. end of that's story. Right. That's right. Um, so it's learning how to, I think that's the most valuable thing that you get from doing your amateur experience. Obviously, like the technique and the skill and everything and repetition and having regular fights and stuff is just the most important thing. So that's the thing I'm learning the most, like going in with these people is actually what it's like to be in the ring. Like, and that sounds really basic, but it is, uh, it's like the pressure of the night, how you fight, how you respond to things. Can you do what you're doing in the gym on fight night? Can you bring it all in? Um, and these are things which I'm starting to get to that position now. And that's mad to say as a, as a world champion, but that was a great learning fight for me when I fought Maria. 
no. you know and that, that, that's crazy to say that yeah. but you know i learned lots from it well it's real i remember when i interviewed um ashley theo Payne, who was um under the mayweather camp for a number of years and he remember once he, he was recalling a moment when he went jogging with um floyd mayweather when he was preparing for the adrian broner fight and he said um the one thing floyd always said to him was i may have an off day in the gym or under the lights, I never have an off day. And as we know, Floyd is Floyd. But um, you're right. Try to cope with the pressure of being under the lights, fighting in a world title, or just fighting a big fight or any fight yeah. under the lights. Yeah. Sometimes people, it's like a deer with headlights. They just kind of yeah. freeze up. Um, so when you fought Savannah Marshall, how different was it fighting Savannah than it was fighting Clarissa Shields? Because you fought Clarissa Shields at middleweight and then you fought Savannah at 154, correct? I mean, no, I fought Savannah at middleweight. She, she, she can't make 154. She's a middleweight. So you, so, so, so you, bought, you fought both of them at, at middleweight? Yeah. Which isn't your natural weight class, because I remember when I first met, you was fighting at 147, which is like welterweight. Yeah, you, so I, I normally fight at 154. It's like my normal weight, but I've gone into different weight categories. Like my last fight in March, I actually uh, fought welterweight. 147. Yeah. yeah. So, and I was planning on staying there, <laughs> but then mm. the opportunity came up, and I was like, hell yeah, I'm taking that. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so they're two very different types of fighters. Uh, they're, you know, it, we're, all, we're all waiting for them to have their fight. That's the fight everybody wants to see, you know? Mm. Um, Who do you think wins that fight? Pardon? I got I to gotta, I gotta put you on the spot right now. Who do you think wins that, Savannah or uh, Clarissa? Clarissa. Yeah. And I, I just, I, I've, I've said that from the beginning, and I truly believe that. I think Carissa wins the fight, but I'm not mm -hmm. going to go into why, but I'm going to say Carissa wins You the know fight. I was going to ask you why. Come on I now. Know, I can't tell. I'm not going to tell you. When the, when, the fight, when the fight is announced, I'll do an interview about it. Uh, okay, bet. Yeah. How different was it fighting Clarissa than, as opposed to Savannah? Was it very different? <laughs> Yeah, because when I fought Carissa, I was in Kansas, uh, in America, <laughs> and it was my first time fighting with DAZN. So, like, we did, like, it was the first sort of time where I've been under the sort of, like, the, the world's view. Like, everyone looking in on the show with Matchroom, Matchroom and DAZN, like, we had to do, we had a live, um, what do you call it, press conference. I was in the yep. press conference, and, like, I knew it was getting beamed around the world. For the first time in my life, I was actually standing up there talking in front of the world, mm -hmm. and that was an experience in itself. Um, and of course, it wasn't during COVID, so we had a full audience. The house was full of people, um, and yeah, no, it, it was very different. And then when I fought Savannah, we, we were in COVID rules, so we were in a bubble. Um, and then the first fight never happened because her uh, Peter Fury uh, tested positive for COVID, so then it was delayed by another couple of weeks. And then when we got in there, there's like there's no crowd. You can't. There's no <laughs> cheering. There's, there's nothing going on. Um, so. You know, it, but they were both on matchroom shows, so they were kind of similar in that regard the setup, yeah. the filming, all that sort of thing. Right. Um, and, and that's the kind of stuff that people don't realize like the, the razzmatazz that goes with like being the main event. You know, it, you have a lot more things to think about. You've got to wait the whole night before it's your turn to get in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> that in itself is stressful. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you've got to sell the fight. You're the main fight, you know, the main attraction. And so there's a lot of other obligations like media and stuff that most fighters don't think about and then you're suddenly in that situation and you've got a lot to do yeah i mean it, when you first started obviously uh your first pro fight you um i should remember because your second pro fight you fought in carl shorten i remember My that first fight. one was in south end i was south laughing end. About, that's that's I was it laughing about this because yeah that's I, it i was uh, on a mo prior show Massive thank you to Mo for giving me my debut. What a legend. You know, like, because I'd come up from nothing. You know, I was like, got my license and I was like, we said to Mo, like, because uh, Mo knows Derek really well. And Derek was like, oh, can you put Hannah on for a debut? So huge thank you to Mo because he started that journey, gave me that opportunity. Um, and we were down in South End in this sort of nightclub. And I remember to get to the ring, I had to walk through a kitchen area. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, fast forward now to my 16th pro fight. Uh, I'm headlining at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. How about um, it? Mental, you know, like the journey yeah. is mental. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm going to talk about some of your opponents. I'm going to talk about some of the losses as well as the victories. I think the good thing about boxing, is, as, you, as you quite rightly mentioned, the journey, you have to reflect on the journey. Yeah. For example, when Floyd Mayweather speaks about his journey, he speaks about that loss in the Olympics when he got robbed. He got yeah. a silver medal when everyone in the world thought he should have won gold. But that loss 
propelled him to never lose his professional. So who yeah. knows, maybe had he had won that gold, he could never, maybe yeah. wouldn't have gone 50 and 0 as a professional. So let's talk about your journey. So, you know, you're now WBA, an IBO um, belt holder, and you are with uh, an elite category of English female champions. And, you know, let's, let's talk about number five. So there's, well, there's actually, well, I would say there's actually uh, four you guys. So there's, there's yourself, there's a uh, Terry uh, Harper, who I'm quite sure you know very well. Terry there's, Harper. The, there's there's uh, Charlotte Cameron, obviously Savannah Marshall, and yourself. Yeah, Chandler As, Cameron, yeah. So uh, you, you fought Savannah Marshall, and then of uh, Terry Harper, as you know, she's super featherweight, so it's not your weight category. Right. Uh, Chantel is campaign, I believe, at 140. I think super it, uh, light, yeah, super, yeah, super light. light. So, so she's at 140. She's in the tournament at the moment, yeah. She just and, won the Ring Magazine belt as well in her last fight. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. So she, she's, 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 she's quite a talent as well. Yeah. And um, I was sparring with her in the lead up to this fight. But did, didn't you spar Savannah Marshall a few times before you fought her? Way back, like way back, yeah. She turned pro, yeah. Um, like well, before her debut, we did some sparring then. Yeah, I remember well. that. that. Seems like forever ago, you know, long time ago. Now, of those four women, what does that feel like? Let's just stop, pause that for a moment. You're in a category of four women. You're one of four women in this country, United Kingdom, who are world champions, female world champions, and all of the aforementioned have had amateur experience besides yourself. Yeah. What does that feel like? Uh, I mean, it's insane really, because it's only just sunk in. Like yesterday was the first day when everything really kind of sunk in and I was like, I I'm WBA world champion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all that sort of like uh, hard work, the, the highs and the lows of my career to this point, mm -hmm. it's all been worth it. And, and it just suddenly all kind of washed over me and I was like, wow, I did that. And um, yeah, just really, really proud. And I think as well, it's, it's great for Scotland. I'm going to do a little put, uh, punt out here because Scotland's obviously got Josh Taylor, who's a huge inspiration to me. Like, massive, massive. I, I think he's an absolute legend. And, yeah. um, you know... Have you met him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a great guy. And I just, I love his, his boxing and what he's done is insane. You know, it's, it's yeah. really, really cool. And, and then to, to be also a world champion coming from Scotland and Scotland has two world champions right now. And then we've got amazing fighters like Lee McGregor and Cash Farouk, they're coming through. Yep. Um, and there's more girls like getting involved, starting off their pro careers. And it's a huge, like Scotland's on fire. Scotland's yeah. on fire at the moment. And we've got some fantastic fighters. Like I'm going up on Friday to Aberdeen to do the commentary with Fight Zone for the show up there. My, my good friend, Dean Sutherland, he's headlining there. Okay. Uh, he won the WBO Youth out in Hamilton, uh, the last one. So yes, okay. Scotland's on fire for boxing and we're such a small country, but we're making right. a lot of noise. <laughs> well, if you talk about athletes, you even go back as far as Andy Murray, who represents Scotland in terms of tennis. Yeah. And so the athleticism that's coming out of Scotland is, is absolutely um, amazing on all levels. Yeah, uh, I mean, we're, we're a tenacious bunch of nutters. <laughs> we don't let things go. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. Um, and another bit of news that um, I want to share with everybody, not that everyone knows about it, but I'm quite sure you do. But uh, I just got this information last night, fresh off the press. Ring Magazine has just <laughs> yeah. voted you top five women in the world yeah. and 154, and you're number two. Yeah. Obviously, they put Clarissa Shield, who still can campaign. She can fluctuate between, yeah. between 154 and 160. She's obviously the champ. And you're listed just below one of your adversaries, yep. Marie DeCale, a girl who you want to fight, from the, the Canadian. Um, well, she holds that um, IBF strap. Well, no, she doesn't currently. I think she's fighting for it in the next week or so. Well, didn't, but she, but she, um, she, used, she, to she used to hold the IBF. That's correct. She, she used to hold the IBF. Marissa. Right. Um, and I think she's due to fight for it again. And I think that's a great fight for her down the line. You know, like, obviously, she's going to want to get a belt and then we can maybe unify. That'd right. be really cool. Like, really cool. Um, and, you know, like the super welterweight division and the welterweight division has always been really hotly contested. There's a lot of exciting things going on. I right. see the middleweight division as kind of like our heavyweight division. Yeah. We're kind of like, it's kind of like our big fights, our exciting fights happen there, like the heavyweights. Yeah. And then welterweight and super welter is like there's loads of movement around there. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's some great challenges, some great fighters out there and people that I, you know, people that I'm 
always looking at there's lots of things going on and things move around and um because mm. i was i was going to campaign at welterweight and work my way towards hopefully challenging for those titles mm. uh but at the moment i'm going to stay at super welter obviously because i'd love to become undisputed that'd be amazing <laughs> because the last time we spoke um the last time we had an interview was, was actually in the COVID era yeah. um and um obviously you had just lost the uh, uh wbc silver belt and um you was coming off a loss in the uh, early part of the COVID era. Um, and that, that was actually your, um, the last time you lost. And I have it here because I actually was talking about that the other day. You fought a girl um, and uh, Patricia, uh, is it Begolt? Oh, WBC I, interim. Interim, is, is that, yeah. am I saying her name, Begolt? Patricia Begolt, yes. Yeah, yeah. That was Malta for the IBO world title and the WBC interim. And that was just before COVID hit. Yeah. And um, that loss, that wasn't um, a loss that you was expecting to, because it was a tight fight, wasn't it? It was a close yeah, fight. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a controversial one. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of views going on. I, I was, for me, the beginning of the fight, I rushed the fight and I got dropped for the first time in my career. So mm. uh, it was a stupid thing. I got dropped in the first, flash knockdown yep. in the first thing. And some people believed I did enough to, to win it, to maintain my titles. Other people said it was enough even to be a draw. Um, some people, and some, and she got the decision. And I, I, you know, I feel like I, there was a point in the fight where I knocked her down. It wasn't counted as a knockdown. Mm -hmm. It was one of those fights. And actually, I went away from home to have that defense um, in Malta. Right. And so there's just a lot of things at play there. And I wanted that rematch. Uh, you know, we, I called for the rematch. We offered the fight. Um, <laughs> there's, there's loads of stuff, but she, right. she wasn't having it. All so, right. um, yeah, no, that, that was a frustrating time for me. And to come back from that, having done all that hard work to get there in the first place right. and lose it all was a really, really difficult time for me. Probably one of the hardest moments in my career. And, 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 and that's what I'm, I'm talking about earlier when yeah. I said in the beginning about the psychology of boxing yeah. and what people realize behind the scenes. When you lose a fight, it can be demoralizing. It could be like yeah. a soul crushing experience. You every you've lost five times, but. And that would be enough, especially if you're coming up through the ranks and you're trying to make a name for yourself. You could have said that for the fifth law. You know what? Man, I've done it. I've done everything I could have done. I'm not going to get the break I want. I'm out. But you, yeah. you kept going. You just kept, well, there was something in you kept going. Well, for me, the first loss was a robbery anyway. I went away to Norway and I got robbed away from home. And everybody said I shouldn't have gone. And I got robbed and it was super annoying. It was one of those things where like, they announced me as the winner on like on the TV channels, but then they had to re-announce the other girl because she got the decision. And we all knew it didn't, it was, it was wrong, yeah. but it's yeah. still good. And that's the thing, this is where problems like, things like robberies on cards can be so detrimental to people's careers and, right. and also to their mental state as well. Uh, because even though you know you didn't lose, it's still gone down as a loss on your record. That's right. Which can affect your opportunities later on. That's so like right. you say, I technically have five losses on my record, but I don't count that first one. But on paper, it's official. That's right. So like, you know, technically I have five losses, but for me it's four. And mm. like the other ones, the Patricia one, Begolt in uh, Malta, yeah. that was a diff that's a difficult one for me. But then when I stepped up to fight Clarissa and fight Savannah, stepped out my weight class, took opportunities, uh, and uh, Alicia Napoleon, stepped again out my weight class to fight, fight great champions and uh, mm. gave a good account of myself in all, yeah. all three of them. But, you know, most people will say Carissa and Savannah are on the pound for pound list as, as fighters. Yeah. So to say I fought two of the pound for pounders in my generation, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, yeah. And like I said, it's what you take from your losses and what you learn from it. And the fact that you can cut, like, do you have the resilience to bounce back from that? And do you still, like, do you have a good team around you that support you? Do you still believe in what you can achieve? And I think the mental side of it is so important. And what people don't realize is how hard it is to come back from a loss. It's very difficult. Well, there you go. Because I'm going to embellish you now at this point. This is where the, the, the embellishment moment of Hannah Rankin comes up. Because I remember looking at that fight. There was three fights in your career that I remember. This is where you came of age. Now, you mentioned... Well, you mentioned all three of them, actually. For the first one, you went up and fought Alicia Espinosa. And yes. you fought her in, in, uh, in New York. Yeah. And I believe that was under the um, Lou DiBella um, Entertainment um, yes. uh, a banner. And that was an experience. I believe that's when you met Andre Ward. Yeah. In that fight, oh, right? Now, absolute dream. <laughs> so cool. Before I get into it, briefly, tell me, what was it like meeting Andre Ward, a legend? 
Well, basically, I, I don't really do famous people. I'm not really, a, uh, I, I don't follow TV. I don't follow famous people. I, it doesn't bother me. But I was, it was one of the few times in my life I'm absolutely starstruck. <laughs> I was just like, it's Andrew Ward. And Noel was like, we're well, asking for a photo. And I was mortified. I couldn't even ask him. <laughs> Noel asked him for me and I got a photo with him. But I was just thinking, oh my God, I met Andre Ward. And like, it just like literally. Well, what, what, what did he say to you? I was like, hey, Hannah, how's it going? You know, how's everything going? You ready for your fight? And he was there in the rules meeting for the fight against Alicia. So he was just chatting away, like just being himself. And he was just as cool as he comes across normally. <laughs> and you was amazed that he even knew your name. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you fought Alicia Espinosa. Yep. Who was obviously at that time, I think she only had lost one fight at that time. And it was actually a super middle. So exactly. like, she was the WBA super middleweight world champion. So when you stepped up to fight her, that was a tough fight. And I remember talking to Noel because I was supposed to go to New York with you guys to watch that fight. And something happened. We couldn't get the arrangement uh, um, together. Yeah. And I was, I was trying to go on the press pass. And I think we just couldn't make that happen, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I was speaking to him after that fight. And he was saying, man, Hannah rocked this girl and yeah. probably could have got the decision. But because of her experience, she kind of edged it towards the end. Yeah, um, it, it was a it was a great fight. Like I, I've, I, me and Alicia have sparred since then, and we were in touch and stuff. Like it was a really good fight, and but it was most frustrating because people couldn't watch it. It was meant to be on Fox Sports, but they turned right. the camera they turned the cameras off for our fight because it was the women's fight. They just turned the cameras off. I was mm. like, Are you, what? Yeah. So like it it was dubbed in the press the best fight you never saw. Yeah, <laughs> I, we I remember that. Yeah, fight, fight on the card, um, and. Yeah, it was an all-out war. And it was my first experience of fighting at championship level. All the rules and regulations, the anti-doping, and that after a fight is something that like the non-glamorous side that nobody else sees is the anti-doping bit where you're waiting and trying to rehydrate so you can actually pee. Uh, mm. so it's like, yeah, it's mad. Um, but, you know, that was a great fight. So, but it wasn't, you know, stepped out of my weight class again and, and took an opportunity. But from that, I my stock rose a lot you know people yes. I suddenly had a following in America yes. I, I, and I never had that <laughs> you know I didn't yep. nowhere near that so I had a following in America people knew who I was and that's when I first met Clarissa she was at the fight she showed the fight on her Instagram stories right um because she, she was oh there. is that yeah. what happened yeah 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 okay. so I, yeah and it was the very first time I met her and then crazily enough I ended up fighting her later on but it was mad you know <laughs> yeah. it was it was several months later you fought Clarissa it wasn't that long afterwards you fought Clarissa Shields is that correct so um it was it was within the year you fought Clarissa Shields within a 12 month I period so. I think so yeah actually yeah. that happened because it came about because she was meant to be fighting um Christina Hamer and mm. I was Christina's sparring partner and I'd been out there training with her loads. Um, and then Christina got sick. So she wasn't able to do the fight when she was meant to do the fight. And um, so everyone was, no one was taking the opportunities to take the fight with Clarissa. Nobody wanted it. And I was like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> like, you know, it's a chance to really find out what, how good you really are. She's, right. one, she's meant to be the best. So you can only, like, if you want to be the best, you got to fight the best. There you you go. got to learn from the best. So, there you, go. you know, I, I said, I'll take it. And we had, like, we did not like each other. Like, in the build up to that fight, we, we were at each other the whole time. Um, where, 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 where did that come from, though? Where did that sort of animosity come from? I think it was because I was training with Christina that started off the initial thing. But, I, but as far as we were concerned, like, we had nothing in common. We come from different backgrounds, different places. Right. Um, like she was the two-time gold medalist, Olympic medalist, like, right. you know, and then I'm, I'm this girl that's come from a tiny little village in Lust, <laughs> box, you know, and like there was, there was nothing, nothing in common we could see anyway. Right. And it made for a brilliant build up to a fight, a great, she said she was gonna knock me out in four rounds. I said, she's never knocked anyone out. We had that build up, you know, it was a constant argument. And then even after the bell, we're going at it. After yeah. the fight, we're still going at it. And um, it wasn't until after that fight, um, I got signed with Salita Promotions and her manager, Mark Taffet, after that. And um, I was sparring with her in, uh, in Florida after that. And we, we had rounds 11 to like 17, you know, wow. we had those rounds. And then after that, we, we got on really well. We realized actually we have very similar kind of focus and drive and, and ambition and what we want for women's boxing, our kind of end goals and things like that. We're very, very similar. 
Right. And since then, we've, we've become really good friends and uh, right. we talk all the time. And uh, yeah, and I really can't wait to see her, actually. I'm looking forward to catching up. So, I mean, can you briefly uh, say something in regards to that camaraderie that boxers share? Because it's something I talk about a lot here at um, our gym here in London um, with people when they want to learn boxing. I often tell people that boxers is a lonely man's sport. 